I don't believe I heard this in the announcements, but it was made earlier, and we did have two baptisms this weekend. Paul Sweeney was baptized yesterday, and um, I believe he's here tonight, or is he not? Okay. Oh, he's in the sound booth. And Jamesia Palmer, she's not here tonight, but she was baptized after, oh, she is here? Okay, well, she's here as well, and you can see them after worship and let them know that we are excited for them to be a part of the family of God. And so we appreciate that and glad for their open hearts and for the power of the gospel that still can change people's lives. <clears throat> One of the mistakes that people make when they read the books of 1 Kings and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles is they believe that the books are identical. And so because Kings has some of the same information as Chronicles, most people will read 1 and 2 Kings and say, well, since I did that, there's no need to read the Chronicles. But that would be a grave mistake. There are a lot of similarities, but there's also a great amount of difference. First and Second Kings talks about the split of the northern and southern kingdom, the wickedness of the kings, and them being carried away into Babylonian captivity. But First and Second Chronicles talks to people that have come home from Babylonian captivity, and it's an encouragement to these Jewish individuals to stay faithful. In fact, throughout First and Second Chronicles, most of what the inspired historian does is tells all of the good things that the kings have done. He mentions very little of their failings and of their shortcomings to drive home the point that if you're faithful to God, you'll be rewarded. But if God's people aren't faithful, they'll find themselves again in captivity. There were only three kinds of kings in Israel. There were kings that were just terrible, bad. All 19 kings from the northern kingdom were that way. It says that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord and they were bad, and that's true about some of the kings in the southern kingdom as well. Then the second type of king would be one that was so-so. Like David in some ways, not a full-blown idol worshiper, but really not a righteous individual. And then the third type of king would be one who would be like David, who was Israel's ideal king, a righteous and faithful person. And that's normally what you have. Tonight, what I want to do is look at the life of a pretty unknown king in 2 Chronicles 25. I want to tell you the story of his life. It's found in 2 Kings 14 and also here in 2 Kings 25, and then draw some lessons from his life. Wesley read for us the first two verses. Amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign in Jerusalem. He started out well. In his 20s, he had more power than most people have throughout the duration of their lives. He reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. We read in verse 2 that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not with a full heart. 2 Kings 14, 3 says, not like David did. And so he started out good, but not totally with a full heart. When he rose to power, he eventually, he immediately took revenge on those that had killed his father. Verses 3 and 4 talk about how he went through and he destroyed all of those individuals who had previously hurt his dad, but he didn't kill their children. In keeping with the law of Moses, which taught that an individual was not to be punished for the sins of their father, Amaziah was righteous enough to spare those children the penalty that belonged to their parents, and so he did that. Shortly after that, he begins to number his army. Now, most kings did this, but it would be different if you were a king in Jerusalem because some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. But in 2 Chronicles 25, beginning around verse 4 and verse 5, he numbers the men, 20 years old and upward. He finds 300,000 warriors that can hold the spear and hold the shield, and he goes out and he gets ready for it. That's not enough for him. In verse 6, he goes to the northern kingdom of Israel, and he finds 100,000 mercenaries. These people don't belong to his army, but he just hires them for 100 talents of silver and wants them to engage with him in battle. God sends a prophet to Amaziah, and he says, you can't go to battle with Israel. In verses 7 and verse 8, they're not God's people. You can't use them in battle. God can exalt and God can put down, but if you go to battle with them, you're going to become God's enemy. And Amaziah says, well, what about the money I paid him? I just gave them 100 talents of silver. And in 2 Chronicles 25, 9, the prophet says, God is able to give you much more than this. He sends the 100,000 prophets home and goes into battle with his 300,000 soldiers by himself. They go up to Edom, verses 12, 11 and 12, and he's there battling the Edomites on Mount Seir, and he defeats them, 10,000 of them. And he takes another 10,000, takes them up to a cliff, and throws them down, and they're dashed to pieces. And he's victorious in battle. After this battle, the people that he sent home previously in verse 13, they go through his homeland, they begin to stir up trouble and start issues, and he brings the gods home from Edom, the people he had just defeated in battle. In verses 14 through 16, he's confronted by the prophet, and the prophet tells him, why are you doing this? These gods couldn't even save their own people when you defeated them in battle. Why would you engage in this idol worship and bring on the wrath of God? At which time Amaziah says to him in verse 16, who made you a counselor or a judge here in Jerusalem? Go your own way before you be struck down. And the prophet assures him that because of his rebellion, 
God will put him down. In his arrogance, his defeat of the Edomites, his win in battle, he decides he'll just go up to Israel and engage with them in battle as well. And that's what he does in verses 17 through 19. He goes up to Joash and he says, let's meet face to face. And Joash says pretty much in a parabolic fashion, you won one small battle in Edom, but you don't want to go to war with us in Israel. Verse 20 says, his mind was set, he went to battle, and he was wrong. He was defeated in battle. Joash defeats Amaziah. All of Israel takes all of the treasures from Jerusalem and eventually ransacks the temple. Near the end of his life, Amaziah, whose life began with prosperity, promise, and military prowess, he runs for his life to Lachish. His people turn on him. They follow him there. And 2 Chronicles 25 ends with him being killed by his own countrymen in Lachish. They bring his body back on horses, and they bury him in Jerusalem. Why is this story in the Bible? Why is this account of his life in the Bible? He was the eighth king in Judah. Not much really special about him in and of himself, but I believe there are at least six lessons we can learn tonight. I want to give us these lessons to launch us out into our week so that we, like the people that initially read this when they came home from Babylonian captivity, might know if we're faithful to God, we have his favor. But if we turn on him, we become his foe, and like Amaziah, we'll suffer the consequences. Number one. Amaziah teaches us that God wants wholehearted devotion. When he started out, verse 1 says he was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, but verse 2 is the one. This isn't just some introductory information about his life. This isn't merely biographical information. It is the trajectory for the way that he lived throughout his time as king. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not with his whole heart. 2 Kings 14 and verse 3 says, He followed the Lord, but not wholeheartedly like David. He was okay, but he wasn't totally faithful. And that was his downfall. As we just rehearsed, in six scenes after this verse, he's on his way down. He numbers the people, not trusting in God. He goes down to Edom, brings back their idols, all the way until he's eventually killed because he had half-hearted devotion. The Bible drives this point home over and over again that what God wants from you and what God wants from me is the entirety of our being. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, and God will give you everything else that you need. Jeremiah 29, 13, mark this verse down. Jeremiah tells the people, you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Why not just say, seek the Lord? Well, God knows that you and I are prone on occasion to only give God a little bit of who we are, and God won't take that. Jesus says the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your mind, all of your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 37 through 40, a half-hearted job won't do. And God wants our whole heart. Amaziah gave God half of his heart, I would argue the wrong half, and it didn't fare well for him, and it won't for us. If we go into our religion, if we go into our Christianity and see what's the little amount? What's the fewest that I can give to God in hours of service and dedication and still be pleasing to him? We might wind up like Amaziah. Notice how many verses stress this idea of perfection, wholeheartedness, and think about all of the kings that you read about. This statement about Amaziah is made about a lot of kings. Hey, this guy was faithful, but not all the way. And notice how the Bible just counteracts this idea altogether. The Shema of Israel, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with what? All of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You could summarize that with all of your being. But it's not just Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 4, 29. You will be blessed when you seek the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. 1 Chronicles 28. Now, David told Solomon this. He didn't follow through, though. 1 Kings 11 and verse 6 shows that he didn't. But as David was on his deathbed, he was driving this home to Solomon. God wants you, Solomon. You will succeed as king if you love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, the psalmist continuously says, I will praise God with all of my heart, with all of my being, Psalm 9 and verse 1 and those others. What about this one in Joel 2? The locust plague is upon the people, and God tells them through the prophet Joel, I will forgive you and abundantly pardon, but only when you turn to me with your whole heart. Rend your heart and not your garments, and I'll pour out abundant pardon. Are you picking up on this theme that runs from cover to cover in the Bible? Without our whole heart, God won't accept us. We need to seek him with our whole heart. What would you do? You went to a restaurant tonight and you said, hey, I want my drink really cold. And they put in one ice cube. How far would you get tonight if the tires on the right side of your car were fully pumped with air, but on the left side they weren't? How far would you be able to travel? How far would you get 
How, how, how would you like living in a house where half of the house gets hot or cold or gets air and the other half doesn't? That would probably drive you half crazy, right? You wouldn't be able to live. You wouldn't be able to survive. None of us really likes a half-done job, and neither does God. One of Jesus' strongest rebukes in Revelation 3, 14 through 16 was reserved for the church at Laodicea where Jesus says, you're neither hot nor cold, and because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. God wants everything we have. If we're honest, some of us, we just major in half-hearted service to God. I know if I'm honest, sometimes I think, well, Hiram, you didn't give that one your best, your sermon or today in your life for God. You just kind of went along with the flow. And I believe that if we're honest, sometimes we're guilty of the transgression of Amaziah. It's like, well, you know, this person, are they, you know, if I'm here long enough, if God allows me to preach here long enough, what may very well happen is I may preach some of your funerals. I may preach yours. And I believe that on a funeral, you should always preach the gospel, but it's always nice to be able to say about an individual, now this person was a faithful Christian. This person was faithful to God. But if a preacher's telling the truth, sometimes you can't say that. What you're forced to say on those occasions is, well, they were, they were okay. Somebody says, well, this person, he's a great song leader, but we, we just don't know if he's going to come. And if he comes, well, we don't know if he's going to be willing. I hope he's in the mood. And she'd be great to teach Bible class. I mean, she's really good with the kids, but sometimes, you know, she, well. And that's not to say never take a quarter off, never need a rest or a break. I'm just saying to us that sometimes we don't give God as just due. We don't give God all that we should. We're on again, off again, and that was Amaziah. He served God faithfully, but not with his whole heart. Here are some areas that we shouldn't give God halfway service in. Number one, our attendance to worship. Hebrews 10.25 talks about this, not abandoning the assembly, and I know we live in the day of live stream, and I know that what I'm about to say needs to be prefaced with 3,000 caveats. I understand that. I just want to say, somebody needs to say this to Christians everywhere. Live stream is not a substitute for in-person worship. That is to say that if a person can't come, and everybody who cannot come because of health concerns and all that, they know who they are. But this isn't a time to say, well, you know, sometimes I come, but now that we have live stream, I'm rather tired, and it's Wednesday night, and I just, I just won't go. Hey, I can just watch online. Or sometimes I go Sunday morning now and then Sunday nights, I just choose not to come. Hey, they're streaming it. That's what it's for. That's not what it's for. It's for the people who are, have these health issues or compromised in some way, and because of that, they choose not to come. Anything otherwise would be half-hearted devotion. I need to serve God with all of my strength. Worship for real every time, John 4, 24. I need to love wholeheartedly. Don't postpone. Don't hold back. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let everything that we do be done in love. Amaziah is a testament to what happens to people who start out half-heartedly, and eventually what wins over is the half that we don't give to God. And so when we read about kings like Amaziah, we need to learn this lesson. Don't give God half. Number two, we need to guard against having evil affiliations. We need to avoid evil companionship. A lot of kings in the Old Testament did this, and Amaziah was no different. When they got into trouble, the first thing they tried to do was align themselves with other individuals who they thought would make them stronger and make them better, and this is what Amaziah does. After he numbers his people, he goes and tries to pay these 100 mercenaries from Israel, and he says 100,000 mercenaries. He gives them 100 talents of silver, and he says, hey, how about we join up? And the man of God, or also known as the prophet, comes to him in verse 8, and he says, you can't do this. God will strengthen you and God will help you in battle, but you can't get together with these Israelites from the northern kingdom because of their idol worship. God is not with Israel, and because of that, you can't be with them. In the New Testament, twice to the same congregation, Paul gives this warning to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Be not deceived. Evil companions, they do corrupt good morals. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14 down through 18, Paul says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then he goes through this course of statements back and forth to get the Corinthians to think about it. What concord or what fellowship has light with darkness or the temple of God with the temple of idols come out from among them and be separate? And though that passage is often used to talk about marriage, that's far from Paul's point. Paul's point is there are false teachers that have come into Corinth, and if the Corinthians begin to entertain those ideas, they'll find themselves on the wrong side of God. Evil companions do corrupt good morals. And I know God doesn't want us to be hermits or to get away from everybody in the world. We can't convert people if we do that, right? We can't go outside of the world. But at the same time, we need to be very careful about the way that we can be influenced by other people. 
Think about people in the Bible that were strong and good and righteous up until they found themselves in situations where the people they were around began to cause them to behave differently because they gave in. Solomon started off great. Just read about the way Solomon rose to power until he married foreign wives. And Ahab was a great guy in 1 Kings 6, 16, until he married Jezebel. And Jehoshaphat was probably a good king 80% of the time, but he just had this idea of fraternizing over and over again with other kings who liked to worship idols. See 1 Kings 22. They were often affected by the kind of people they hung around. And the message for us as Christians is this. We're in the world. Paul said, if you want to get away from sin, you pretty much have to go outside of the world. The admonition to Christians is, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That is, don't engage in sin with them, but be very careful because sometimes we're social sinners, right? People talk about social drinking. Well, I'm pretty sober until I get around other people. Sometimes, you know, hey, I don't curse. But if people on the job are doing it, hey, I... Okay, so I slide in one, but I do a low level, you know, a D word. It's not as bad as the big stuff. I just kind of, you know, evil companions corrupt good morals. I gave up drinking and smoking and tobacco. I gave up all of that stuff. But when I'm around other people, you know, it just, I'm just going along with it. It's not who I really am, but just for this occasion, can't you hear Amaziah thinking to himself? He later argues about the silver. He says, I can't give it up. I've already paid this. Evil companions corrupt good morals. And the Bible is warning us to be careful that if we must be around other people that don't share our allegiance, and we will, that we must always be the ones on the offense exerting our influence and not receiving the influence from them. We must guard ourselves. We shouldn't think, well, everybody else is influenced by that stuff, but preacher, I'm strong. It won't affect me. You know how long I've been a Christian. We all can fall if we're not careful, and we need to be warned. Number three, God gives more than man. Amaziah pays these mercenaries, and the prophet tells him, look, you can't go to battle with them or you'll lose God's favor. And he says, well, what about the money I already paid? And in one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, it's right here in 2 Chronicles 25, 9. The prophet says, God is able to give you much more than this. What did he think God was going to do? What should the prophet say? Well, since you already paid, let it go. Imagine a woman being ready to be married. It's her wedding day, and she finds that her fiancé has been sending text or phone calls to somebody else in a rather romantic fashion. What should she do? What would you say? Well, you've got on the dress, and all of these people are here. I guess you just go through with the wedding. You know you would say, you can do better than that. I knew a preacher one time. He was bringing a man in for a gospel meeting, and... On his way to bring the guy in, the meeting was a few weeks out. Somebody said, now, I don't know if you know this, but this man, he teaches false doctrine, and you should call him and talk to him, and maybe he's repented, but if not, I don't think you should bring this individual in. At which time the preacher said, well, I can't uninvite Brother X. I've already told him to come. I'll just have to repent later. Amaziah needed to know this. Not only could he not go to battle with Israel, but forget about the 100 talents of silver. God gives more. If we do God's will, God is the God of much more. We always win when we do God's will. It doesn't matter what the world is offering. It always pays to do the right thing. He should have given the 100 talents of silver back immediately and realized that God could give him what he needed and then some. But he shouldn't be bought as God's spokesman because in the end, God gives us what we need and then some. Consider these passages which teach that God not only supplies our needs but often goes above and beyond what we need. Look at these. Ephesians 3 and verse 20, Paul doesn't just say God hears prayer. He says he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you ask or even think. God's the God of much more. When he talks about peace in Philippians 4, he says, Now you pray, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, and then Paul says, it just passes all understanding. Wherever the stick is, wherever the line of what individuals can comprehend, God's the God of much more. He doesn't just give peace. Paul says he gives more than that. He's the God that allows our cup to run over. You remember what David said? He anoints my head with oil. My cup what? It spills over. You know why our cup runs over? God's the God of much more. Psalm 50 and verse 10, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and every beast of the forest belongs to God. Jesus says, I've come that they might have life, but not just that we might enjoy life, but that we might have it in abundance. Or we have exceeding great and precious promises. The Bible just lays this on layer after layer. God doesn't only bless, but God blesses to the point that his people are often overwhelmed with how many blessings he pours down on us and showers us with. 
we don't serve God just because of what he gives, but the truth is what he gives is amazing and it more than supplies our needs. Amaziah needed to hear this. You are going to win if you do it God's way. Forget about what you've paid. Don't count what you've lost. And if we're honest, maybe there are times when we think it really doesn't pay to do what's right. I'm, I'm being a Christian, and I don't really see any wins in my column. I could be doing better if I went this way. Maybe if I compromised just this once. And the prophet's saying, God's able to give much more than this. Whatever you would profit by disobeying God, it is pennies. These are pennies. It's scraps compared to the heavenly blessings that are ours in Christ. One of the best things that's said about Moses is said in Hebrews 11, verse 25, when it says, By faith, Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season or the passing pleasures of sin. Moses knew that if he stayed in Egypt, he'd be wealthy, he'd be exalted to a position of prominence, but in the end, he'd lose out. And though he wandered in the wilderness, and most people would look at Moses and say, Moses, you're a fool, you lost, you could have the gold of Pharaoh's household. Moses knew this. God's able to give much more than this. We sing a song, when you look at others with their wealth untold, think that he has promised you a land of gold, right? Count your many blessings, name them one by one. You'll be surprised what the Lord has done. God's the God of much more. And when Amaziah learned that lesson, he was able to at least temporarily make the right decision. Here's number four. Don't dismiss God's word. After he wins his battle, you remember he comes back and he has the God of the Edomites, the gods of the Edomites, verses 14 through 16 tell us that he was worshiping these gods and the prophet came to him and told him, why are you doing this? Why are you worshiping these idols? They weren't even able to help the Edomites against you in battle. They weren't able to help their own people. Why would you worship their gods at which time? Amaziah just dismisses him. Now, he started this earlier in verse 9 when he hesitated about giving the money back, but he says, okay, I'll give the 100 talents of silver back. It's wasted money. I've paid. But now he's at refusal point. The prophet comes to him and tells him something that he doesn't like, and he just says, listen, who made you a counselor in Egypt or in Israel? Get out of town. And the prophet assures him in verse 16, God's going to put you down and destroy you because of what you've done in this idol worship. Many times in the Old Testament, the kings reject the words of the prophets because they just didn't like what they had to say. Don't be dismissive about the word of God. When you hear sermons preached, and I, I guess there's some sort of, I don't know, this, an art to listening to sermons, just put out all of the other things. We get so distracted by other things. Don't dismiss the word of God. Here are a few reasons why we do this sometimes. And we give ourselves a pass to do it. I'm telling you, this is dangerous. Number one, we sometimes dismiss the word of God because we don't like the person. We may not like the preacher, but it happened in the Old Testament. In 1 Kings 22, Jehoshaphat and Ahab, they're about to go to battle. And Ahab has his 400 prophets tell the king, hey, go into battle. You'll be successful. Jehoshaphat says, are there any other prophets? He says, Ahab said, oh, yeah. There's one, Micaiah, but I hate him. He never prophesies good concerning me, only evil. I don't like him. He doesn't preach what I like. And sometimes people dismiss the word of God because they don't like what it says. But that's not all. Sometimes we dismiss the word of God because it challenges us. Everybody here likes to be comfortable, don't you? You come in, you start fanning, it's hot, right? Or it's cold. Just set the air, set the temperature the way that I like. We like to be comfortable. And sometimes that's true with preaching. We don't like preaching too much. That makes us a little squirmy in the seat. I hope he hurries up and gets off this point. I'm feeling a little uncomfortable, aren't you? We're never going to grow like that. In Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is preaching this piercing sermon to these Jewish people, it was exactly what they needed to hear. Verse 54 says they were stabbed to the heart. It's what they needed. This would help people on the day of Pentecost become Christians, but not these folks. They didn't like it. Sometimes it's personality. And in Philippians 1, Paul talks about this. In verses 15 through 18, Paul says, Some people preach Christ from envy and strife, supposing I had affliction to my bonds. But Paul was so focused on the message. He said, As long as they preach Christ, I rejoice in that and I will rejoice. Sometimes we just push the word of God aside because it's different. It's challenging us in ways we have. Now, preacher, we like you, but we've been doing it this way at South Florida Avenue for a long We don't plan on changing, right? We are kind of set in our ways, and, you know, you are all right until you started challenging us and put, I, I'm not doing that. I don't care what he said. I'm just going to do it my way. I've been doing this this way for, we get set in our ways. 
You know what they did to Stephen when they couldn't take it anymore with Stephen? They just picked up stones. Acts 7, 57. The Bible says they stopped their ears. You think kids are the only one that do la, 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 la. Well, that's what they did with Stephen, like little kids. And sometimes in a church, the auditorium can be the biggest nursery in the room. Little kids, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to listen to what you say. I don't care. I'm going to do it my way. This is how we've always done it. This is how we will. The question is always, is this scriptural? Is this the right way to do it? And if it's not, are we humble and honest enough to change? Amaziah didn't like the word. But you know, the word of God didn't change just because he didn't like it. Just because we don't like what the Bible says doesn't mean it's going to change. And this is always great for people out there. And people out there in the denomination need to hear it. And we need to hear it too. Beware of dismissing the word of God because in so doing, we bring on God's doom on ourselves. Number five. Don't let success ruin you. I want to read this one because I think it's interesting that after he wins this battle with the Edomites, Amaziah just makes up his mind. He's going to go to battle with Israel. And notice what the king says to him. I'm in verse 17 down through verse 19. Then Amaziah, the king of Judah, took advice, and he sent to Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, the king of Israel, saying, come, let us see one another face to face. That's verse 17. That's a challenge. Let's go to battle one against another. Remember, he had just defeated 10,000 Edomites and threw another 10,000 off the cliff. He's feeling himself. He says, let's go to war. Listen to the response in verse 18. Joash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, the king of Judah, saying, the thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give your daughter to my son to wife, and there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trolled down the thistle. You say, Lo, you've smitten the Edomites, and your heart is lifted up to boast. Remain at home. Why should you meddle to your hurt that you should fall, even you and all of Judah with you? The parable in verse 18 is impressive. What he says is this. Can you imagine a little thistle? coming to a, a cedar tree and saying, hey, you and I are equals. I want your daughter to wife. Give me your daughter. He's saying, you think that you and I are equals because you won some little battle with Edom. No, we're the wild beast that will come along and destroy you from Israel. He's saying, now you won a little battle, but don't let pride get to you. You won't be successful against us in battle. And Amaziah went to battle with them, and you know how it ends. They were destroyed. We should be aware of letting pride get to us. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We need to be careful that we don't get lifted up with pride because God is able to bring us down and to bring us low. And that's what happens with Amaziah. He learns this lesson that just because you've enjoyed some minor success in some ways, he needed to remember, do you know why he won the battle against the Edomites? God was with him. Jim gets an A for the day. That's right. God was with him. That's why he won the battle, right? That's what the text says in verse 8, that God's able to exalt people and bring them down. The only reason why he was successful was because God was with him. And when he departed from God, he was in bad shape to fight anybody. And he forgot that, and it led to his downfall. People wonder what Captain E.J. Smith was doing April 14, 1912. They say at about 1140, he came out and he said, what did we hit at, what at which time? One of his other officers said to him, an iceberg, sir. In 40 years on the sea, he had never really gotten into any accidents on the sea. Neither were any credited to his account. He had been pretty accident-free. But in a few hours after that time, he was about to be involved in one of the greatest sea disasters of all time. 15,000 passengers and shipmates of his would die on the Titanic. There are so many conspiracy theories and legends about what happened to Captain Smith. Some people say he jumped off board with a baby in hand. And some people say that maybe he survived, and there are up to five various stories about how he died. Some make him sound heroic and some humiliating, but here's the point. The 40 years of his clean track record and the boast that the Titanic made as it went out to sea that not even God could sink this ship, he couldn't rely on any of that as the ship went down. And maybe sometimes in our arrogance we think to ourselves, well, nobody's able to bring me down. We better remember who the true captain of life is. Be still and know that I'm God. I will be exalted among the heathen, Psalm 46.10. I'm persuaded the more I read the Bible, if it takes an iceberg to put us in our place, God may very well do it. Ask Edom in Obadiah verses 3 and 4. Edomite said, who can bring me down? God says, I will reach to the cleft of the rock and bring you down. In Isaiah 14, Babylon is exalted, and he calls the king of Babylon Lucifer, and he says, I will bring you down and put you in your rightful position. God can do it to us. 
in the margin of one of my Bibles, in Hosea chapter 13 and verse 6, I have this statement written, prosperity begets amnesia. In Hosea 13, 6, the passage is about this idea that when Israel was in the wilderness, they didn't know God, God supported them, but when they got to the promised land, they got fat and they ate well, and you know what happened? They forgot God. And history shows that while prosperity in and of itself is not sinful, often a blessing from God, we struggle. You remember when you just wanted to serve God? You just did what God said because God said you didn't need much. You really didn't complain a lot. You obeyed the gospel. You were just a Christian. Whatever anybody said, you would do it. But now we kind of get picky. Just wanted to do whatever we could to serve and work in the Lord's kingdom. And then over time, pride gets to us. It gets in the way. Paul told the Corinthians, what do you have that you haven't received? And if you've received it, why do you behave as if you didn't? 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 7, beware of letting what we term success ruin us, because it can. Solomon was the richest man in all the world, but he forgot God with his wives and all of his prosperity, and he died a pitiful man because of that. Now, here's the last one, number six from the life of Amaziah. Our success is connected to our relationship with God. The text tells us in verse 27, not only did he try to run to Lachish and there was he killed by his own countrymen and brought back on horses, but it happened when? When he turned away from the Lord. If you turn one page in your Bible in 2 Chronicles 26 and verse 5, his his son Uzziah, it says that as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And that's true about you and me. That's to, to the degree that we'll prosper. As long as we seek the Lord, as long as we're on good terms with God, we'll prosper. If we forsake the Lord, we won't. I know there's the health and wealth gospel that says if you obey, God will pay. That's not true. But I want to tell you something that's as kindergarten as anything in the Bible. If you do what God says, God will bless you. That's just what the Bible says. Not always monetary, not always in material things, but God will bless you. And if you disobey God, you'll be punished. That's just what the Bible teaches. In a general sense, maybe not now, but in eternity, you'll be punished. In Deuteronomy 28 and 29, Israel has these parallel situations laid out for him where God says, if you do what's right, you'll be blessed more than you could ever ever fathom. And then God turns and spends the majority of his time talking about the curses where he says, if you turn away from me, you haven't seen the kind of turmoil that you'll experience. You'll be practicing cannibalism as you eat each other's children and starvation. The nations will run you out one person versus a thousand. Life will be terrible. That'll happen. Your success will end. The psalmist said, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night, and he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Whatever he does, it'll prosper. And you know why? Because he's linked to the Lord. And that's true about our success to the degree that we're linked to the Lord. It's to the degree that we'll succeed. Amaziah had a great run as king up until the point that he forsook God. And things started going downhill for Amaziah the moment he said, "Uh, I've got all that I need from God. I can do it on my own now. You see this happen with athletics and with superstars, right? They have these humble beginnings, then they get the money and the power, and then they don't need them anymore. And sadly, sometimes you see it happen with Christians. God, if you just help me, I'm willing to serve you. I want to be your disciple, and then I can take it from here. We never can take it from here. We always need God's help. And let us not be like Amaziah and find that out the hard way. At 25 years old, Amaziah was living a life that very few people would ever enjoy at his age. But he died at 54, on the run, in another country, in another place, with the hatred of his own countrymen behind him. And they drug him back, not in chariots, but on horses, and they buried him in the city of David. I don't know if anybody here knows sign language, But sign language, I wonder, where did we get this from? But sign language for so-so is this, right? You said, well, how was Amaziah's life? Eh, he was all right. He was, that's it. I may not do your funeral. You may may be present at mine. And the truth is, it's really not going to matter what the people that are living say. You can't preach a man out of hell or into heaven. There's nothing we can do about that. But our legacy will live on. And much like Amaziah was once alive and vibrant, and now he's a chapter and a page, One day you'll be too. And it's not going to do to say, well, what kind of Christian was she? She attended South Florida Avenue. Was she faith when you say, well, she was all right. Not with her whole heart. Not a a total heathen. Maybe sometimes Sunday Sunday nights on occasion. He was all right. He would lead singing sometimes and maybe teach a time or two. On fire, I wouldn't say that, but he was okay. 
may half-hearted devotion die among the people of God. None of us are going to be perfect, but we can't give God half of our heart because every time we do, we always give him the wrong half. And Amaziah is in your Bible and my Bible tonight to say, you're in an advantage. He can read about it. You can. Don't be like him. What Jesus demanded of people was their all. No man can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other. Serve the right one. Maybe tonight somebody wants to follow in the steps of the people on the day of Pentecost when they obeyed the gospel, in the steps of Paul Sweeney or in the steps of Jamesia, believing that Jesus is Christ, turning from sin and confessing Jesus as the Son of God and allowing your body to be immersed in water, to have your sins forgiven, to rise to walk in newness of life, and from that moment, give God your all. Tucker's going to lead us in a song. If we can help you tonight, the elders will be down here waiting to receive you. Come now as together we stand and as we sing.